Good evening, ladies and gentlemen. Thank you all for being here tonight. I'm Crosby Kemper, the director of the library. Um, I want to thank tonight uh, John Heron uh, in U UMKC uh, History Department for suggesting uh, this uh, tonight. I've been a fan of Rebecca Solnit's uh, writing uh, for some time, but uh, John suggested I take a look at, uh, at this book, which is wonderful, and I'll, I'll uh, explain why I think it's wonderful in, in a second when I introduce Rebecca, but uh, uh, I, I think it, it is a great project for the library and the history department at UMKC to work on together to create uh, a similar kind of atlas of uh, Kansas City and, and invite any of those of you who are interested in maps, the history of Kansas City, the, the various communities, the, uh, or who just have an imagination uh, of the kind that Rebecca has uh, to explore that idea uh, with us. I also want to thank uh, the Hall Center uh, at uh, KU who are uh, bringing uh, Rebecca into our neighborhood and who let us uh, piggyback on, on top of that. I want to thank Victor Bailey for that. Tonight, uh, I think we're really privileged to have Rebecca Solnit. Um, she is one of the unique voices uh, in American writing, American journalism. Uh, uh, she reorders our, our thinking uh, in the way she looks at the world. Um, she looks at the world and sees it differently than most of us see it. She gets us out of our stereotypes. Uh, uh, her book, A Paradise Built in Hell, uh, was widely reviewed, well-reviewed, uh, a book about disasters built on the Katrina uh, disaster, uh, but looking at others, the San Francisco uh, earthquake, uh, et cetera, uh, and, and uh, talking about uh, uh, how our, our stereotypes from the top down always get in the way of dealing with it, but how civil society, we as individuals with our, our various instincts of community can come together and, and solve problems that uh, FEMA or the governor or the mayor, uh, not picking on any particular governor or mayor yet, not yet, um, uh, I can't, can't solve. Um, uh, the, uh, she, she, in this book, The I Infinite City, she reorders the way we think about uh, San Francisco or, or we would think about any city. Um, uh, n notions of what good order are disappear uh, as she talks about uh, food uh, and, and the environment together. Uh, San Francisco, uh, we think of as a great gourmet paradise. It's the city of rice um, uh, it, it, it's It's the city of Ghirardelli for sure, but it's also the city of Dow Chemical, uh, the city of Anchor Brewing. Uh, it, it's, but it's a city that's, that's dumped endless waste into the, into the bay and off the coast. Um, uh, she, she has a, a one map in, in here of monarch butterflies and the, the, uh, what she calls the queer community, the gay community, uh, an interesting uh, mixture, uh, but, but, but all uh, flowering uh, uh, for sure. Um, a, a, a section on tribes, all the different tribes, and, and she mixes up our, our view of community, it seems to me, uh, with these, uh, her notion of, uh, of tribes in a, in a wonderful, uh, wonderful way. If I could find it, I'd just go through a couple of them. Well, I can't find it. Um, no. um, so communities, African Americans, Mexican, homeless, skateboarders, people in ties, Chinese, Italians, tourists, nonprofits, more Chinese, Russians, runners, homeless, students, Chinese. It's, it's a reordering of the way we see the world, the way we, we, uh, we discuss uh, community. Um, and as she says about herself, uh, she's, she's haunted by the, uh, the city uh, that, that she loves. And, and I think there's a lot of love in, uh, in this book and, and in all of what, what she writes. And I, I love the image that she has in a, a, a Paradise uh, Built in Hell uh, of what the result was uh, of the San Francisco earthquake. Of course, all the electricity went out and the gas lights and all the lights went out. And what happened? The stars came out. Ladies and gentlemen, a star herself, Rebecca Solnit. <laughs> Sorry, uh, Suzanne Monahan, who's not Rebecca Solnit. So uh, but completely different. Yeah, a, different, a completely different star. We did a contest, uh, which Suzanne will explain, uh, based on Rebecca's book, on, an online contest, and she's going to reward uh, the winner. So, sorry. Welcome. Well, after we got the chance to look at Rebecca's book of reimagined maps of San Francisco, we thought, wouldn't it be great to have an atlas of Kansas City? So, over the past week, the Kansas City Public Library has asked Facebook fans and Twitter followers to submit their own unique idea for themed maps of Kansas City. For example, mine was the best, um, Kansas City restaurants serve the best French fries, and that didn't win. So, <laughs> I don't know why, it seems very interesting. Um, 
By today's noon deadline, 11 people had submitted their entries to be judged by our own Missouri Valley Special Collections Manager, Eli Paul. It was not an easy task, but after intense deliberation, a decision was made. So congratulations to April Fleming. She's not here. I'm gonna accept her award on the behalf of the Academy. Um, <laughs> April will receive a signed copy of Rebecca Solnit's book, Infinite City, that you can also purchase after the event, and a vintage map of, of Kansas City from the Gallup Map Company. April's idea was for a comprehensive interactive map of downtown Kansas City and the River Market showing building, buildings that have come and gone and how the streets have changed over time. April's map showcases how late 19th, 19th and early 20th century downtown Kansas City compares to the area today. Eli says her map has a good combination of geography and time and I'd love to see it made. You can visit kclibrary.org and check out the KC Unbound blog to view all 11 submissions. So, thank you again. Here's to Crosby. Now, after blowing it, I'll try and get it right this time. The stars come out. Rebecca Solnit. Thank you. Thank you so much for coming. It's exciting to see this many people who are interested in maps, even of some completely different city way over yonder. At, um, so Infinite City came out of a lot of desires I had. I had always loved maps. It wasn't until the book I came out that I found out I was very far from being alone in that. People really love maps and they make people happy in some mysterious and exceptional way that's really different than what written and visual stuff does. And I think there's some desire, some belief that at last we'll know where the hell we are, uh, that there's kind of the pleasure of a riddle the, that kind of problem solving puzzle of, okay, if this is over here, then this is north, but where's the cheese factory kind of thing. But so I really love maps, but I also felt we were almost entering a post map era. This is a snapshot from one morning in the University of Wyoming uh, cafeteria where they have these, the coffee cups had maps on them. I was looking at the New York Times weather map, and there's a certain way in which maps are ubiquitous, but a lot of young people use their phones. Before that, people use Garmin devices and MapQuest and things to navigate. So this process of looking at big paper maps that I grew up with is not quite so common. But also, even the gas station maps I own from the 1960s are incredibly beautiful in their own, in, in a modest way. The older maps are really beautiful. I would argue that actually that weather map is pretty nice with its shades of colors. I kind of like the cup too, which is why there's a picture of it. But you know, they're, MapQuest is a long ways from this, to say the least. You know, just maps were really beautifully made. So I wanted to reinvigorate maps. And since I'm in a library, um, and you know, on one of the maps I actually claim, because there's always this question in the United States, where you're from, where you belong, whether you're local, native, indigenous, that I am indigenous to public libraries. I grew up in them. With, um, Without them, I'm nothing, both in terms of research and in terms of my books being read. And um, so I like to joke to librarians, I wanted to do a state-of-the-art atlas. I wanted a technology that was universally accessible, that was archival, that might be here in 500 years, and that did not depend on paying corporations monthly fees or having expensive electronic devices. And the technology of the future is paper, um, much. <laughs> which bears a remarkable resemblance to the technology of the past. And, um, but really, I wanted, I wanted to make maps big. I wanted to make them beautiful. I wanted to make them so that people over 60 and people who don't own it, devices could access them. I, nothing on your phone is very beautiful. I'm amazed by people who watch movies and things on their, your phone. But a map is about space, and this is not very much space. Um, to, I, I think we can all agree. So I actually had a very funny experience when I talked about that atlas before I'd done any, when it was just a, pro, a, a project I was launching at a memory maps conference at Cambridge. And these two young women from Bristol took me aside and told me that paper was elitist and I should really have downloadable cell phone apps. <laughs> and uh, I'm still pretty amazed that, you know, anybody at all thinks that way. But so, so I, I wanted to make maps beautiful again. I wanted to, 
make paper maps that are absolutely current, and I wanted to make some postulates about maps. And we tend to look at the same maps over and over. Here's the kind of boring map we're used to looking at. Um, you know, this is, a, this is a Google map of, you know, it shows you freeways, it shows you parks, uh, it shows you major thoroughfares. I don't know what the highlights are that they picked, but um, the old Warson Country Club is there. You're not seeing any migratory birds, you're not seeing any crimes, you're not seeing heartbreak. You're not seeing the most delicious anything. You're not seeing toxic waste sites. There's a lot of conventionality in mapping. Another thing that's happened is maps became less and less the way that we deal with space, even though there's this kind of newfound passion for space, for place. They, became, they ceased to be very creative. You know, we get kind of the AAA maps, we get the Google maps. But maps are really subjective, and what you do with maps has everything to do with what the results are. You know, for example, uh, oh, whoops, where's it? Sorry, these are not, per I am so not a PowerPoint person, speaking of old fashioned. Like this is, you know, you hear about red states and blue states. Here it's done by county, and you can actually see that one of the really interesting geographies of the United States, some young geographer should do a dissertation on, is the way that college towns form these little kind of blue oases and oceans of red across. <laughs> You know, there's a kind of liberal archipelago in a Red Sea across the continental United States. You can see Laramie, Wyoming, where I was. You can see Missoula. You can probably see wherever the hell Lawrence is on that map. You can see, I bet, I bet, Chapel, I bet Chapel Hill and Athens and things are pretty visible. But, uh, and is that Austin calling out to us among the blue spots and the, the few blue spots in Texas? But so you can map it that way and the states are red and blue or you can, you know, and what's, one of the things that's interesting, there's a very strong correlation, not only to where the college towns, but to college degrees with the, the map. But the truth is that there are no red and blue states. This is a wonderful map somebody did. I think it might have been during the 2004 elections that shows every state depending by how red or how blue the vote was. So you can see there's some pretty, there's some violet states. Utah comes pretty close to being red, but it's got a little, it's kind of fuchsia. And um, there are no red states and blue states. So maps, maps are really subjective. It really depends on how you do it. They can be incredibly beautiful. And one of the things I did by bringing artists into mapping um, was to try and make maps beautiful in the 18th and 19th century way again. So, um, you know, so Infinite City was also about the fact that, you know, there are so many ways to read a place. The title is a riff on Italo Calvino's wonderful poetic book that's not really a novel because it's not really about plot and characters and et cetera. At, uh, wake up, you. Oh, we're back in the slow zone here at um, somehow this, this particular map is a huge file. It will come, I think. Or one of the Apple tech people will rush up and save us from ourselves. But also, it's called Infinite City, not because the atlas is infinite. It's tw at, so after Calvino's uh, invisible cities, but with the sense that every place exists in innumerable versions, and each of you contains many maps of Kansas City, the practical one of how to get from here to your house. If you, if, how many of you grew up in Kansas City? Wow, about less than half of you. You know, maybe, you know, maps of high school heartbreaks and childhood traumas or, you know, this, the places you've never been. Etc. But there's so many different versions of a, you know there's in, in, potentially infinite versions, and I did Infinite City as an atlas not to suggest that like I had mastered all the ways you should think about San Francisco, but really as a provocation to encourage people to go out and do it on their own. There's a wonderful newscast on the FM free format rock station that I grew up with, um, a guy named Scoop Nisker who then became a Buddhist writer reverted to his name Wes Nisker. He always, his sign off was always, if you don't like the news, go out and make some of your own. And I'm really excited that, you know, even if you do like the news, you can go out and make some of your own. That Kansas City is talking about doing an atlas, which I hope we'll talk about more in a little bit. So this is the, this is the first map in the book. It's called The Names Before the Names. And I went and talked to a ton of people. I am not really the great expert on anything exactly. I'm good at, I'm just trained as a journalist. I'm good at like running around and finding people who are the great experts. I went to the Estuary Institute, which deals with all the, the watery stuff and you know, the Bay Area is named after the, the Bay itself. And um, they deal with the wetlands, the marshes, the Bay, the hydrology, et cetera. 
And I told them I was thinking about doing, I contracted the last map in the bay with them, in the atlas with them, but I also talked to them about doing um, a map, just a map that I was thinking of doing, which was shell mounds, which are Native American uh, piles of, you know, that when you have a village in one place for 3,000 years and you eat shellfish, you end up with a lot of, uh, a lot of seashells. So these mounds all around the Bay Area and coupling them with the biotech uh, firms, which are also uh, ring the Bay Area because they came late in the history of the Bay Area. They ended up in the wetlands and the landfill like the shell mounds because that's what was left. And this Native American guy, a local guy said, you know, we don't really like you to map that stuff because we want people to leave them alone. And I was like, uh, oh, I guess I can't do that map, okay. And I just sort of thought he might just stop there and he said, and then he said like, you know, look at these maps we've been working on. And this is, I grew up in the Bay Area. I've been there since I was four. I know it pretty well. And he showed me these, wonderful maps because they made the place strange again. They had all the native names on them, which you can see in the book, maybe not so well here. And it was a reminder that this place had been someplace completely different, that there had been other people here with other names. There's a few of them like Petaluma, Alima, Napa that survived. Napa is something everybody's heard of. The other ones are pretty local names, but mostly those names are, are not known. And so we did this as the opening map to remind people that no matter how long you've been here, you probably don't really know where you are, that this place is also something else. And the way that the these little villages, each with their own name, um, were so evenly scattered, I loved. And the way that Leah Chandra, the designer at University of Ca California Press, made the map, made it so beautiful. It always looks like leopard spots or something to me, these evenly spaced orange words. The, the color's also a lot better in the original. Somehow these projectors always bleach the color. But it actually, the design was really important, and Leah was the major collaborator on this book, along with the cartographers Ben Peace and Shizu Segal. And um, Leah came to our first meeting knowing that she wanted a tall, skinny book so that the map, the shape of the map wasn't a page, but this page spread, that we needed to have something to make the maps consistent in style. So we have the same border and the same kind of title plates, same fonts. And I sent her lots of samples of pastel, uh, um, cartographic colors from old maps, and we spent a lot of time working on the colors. So this is the second map in the book called uh, Green, Green Woman. I borrowed the map from a book that had come out a little earlier, Dick Walker's wonderful his environmental history of the Bay Area. All the green spaces you see are protected uh, land, you know, land trusts, national parks, state parks, county parks, city parks, etc. and all those green splotches add up to an area bigger than Yosemite National Park, and uh, which is pretty amazing. And you don't usually see it as a whole like that. You see, you know, uh, one jurisdiction, green belts, or national parks, the national seashore or something. But what I also knew, and Dick Walker had written about so beautifully, is that the reason those green spots are there is because of, what, you know, is because of ferocious battles. We often look at natural space, landscape, wilderness, national parks, et cetera, and think, oh, that's where nothing happened. There were no developers, there were no railroads, there were no strip mines, whatever. But often something very uh, intense happened, which was a battle to protect it and to keep it out of the hands of the people who wanted to exploit it. In the Bay Area, as in a lot of other places, um, it was uh, a woman, often housewives, often affluent, who had the time and the resources uh, to fight the battles, who fought the battles for a lot of this land. So the bo border, in the style of the ornamental borders of 19th century maps, World's Fair maps, et cetera, commemorates um, those green women who did amazing things to protect the place to, and uh, you know, and it's also because men's names tend to, on the United States, end up on a lot of things. In the Bay Area, we, in San Francisco is after St. Francis, we have Muir Woods. We have Fremont after John Charles Fremont, who named the Golden Gate and a lot of the other stuff among the many interesting things he did. But there's almost nothing named after women. There's one of the green women here has a, a um, hill on Angel Island named after her, and that's about it. So it felt like putting the women on the map was a good thing to do to remember, you know, that what looks like the places nothing happened or because everything happened and because people worked hard to make them happen. One of the things I really love about maps is that time doesn't exist and, and the way that it exists in narrative. Maps are, 
you know, they're, they're completely linear spatially, they're nonlinear temporally. So I mapped Edward Moybridge, the photographer who laid the foundation for motion pictures in San Francisco in the 1870s and 80s, together with Alfred Hitchcock's Vertigo. So you have the birth of cinema and this great pinnacle of con modern cinema coexisting. And it was wonderful to see how close they came to each other in these places. The, um, the pink dots are vertigo, the blue, the blue squares are Moybridge. And then the map was looking a little empty. These were very improvisational maps. You know, I had the data on Hitchcock and Moybridge already, but so I thought, well, let's put on movie theaters. So we put on all the movie theaters that existed in 1958 when Hitchcock's movie Vertigo debuted. And for those of you who don't know it, Vertigo is a wonderful noir movie starring Kim Novak and Jim, Jimmy Stewart that takes place doesn't just take place in San Francisco. San Francisco is like the real uh, heroine of the movie in that, you know, women are fickle, men are treacherous, but places uh, never stand you up. And so the movie's really a valentine, not to the incredibly beautiful white-haired Kim Novak in that movie, but to the city that's equally sort of mysterious and changeable and beautiful, as I think most film noir movies are. They're really geographical uh, love letters of a sort. But so we put the movie theaters on, and the shocking thing is the orange ones that no longer exist, the green ones still exist. So you can see the death of neighborhood movie theaters, which is a story that's gone in in most American cities in the past uh, 30 or 40 years since the rise of television and then the VCR and then the video store and then Netflix and then streaming and, you know, on all those exciting reasons to never leave your house again. At, um, and it really was very much about upending convention a little bit. And um, I, everybody knows that San Francisco and the Bay Area are very left wing and peacenik, et cetera. And when somebody like Newt Gingrich talks about San Francisco values and Nancy Pelosi, um, you know, he's not, you know exactly what he means. But the funny thing is, the Bay Area, without us, the Pentagon is nothing. At, uh, you know, the, the, Hydrogen bomb was invented at uh, Livermore Labs out here. And, um, you know, Chevron and Bechtel, two major uh, Bush supporting firms that deeply involved in the war in Iraq and the oil in Iraq um, are ba were, were based in San Francisco. Chevron moved to the suburbs. Um, just a huge amount of important stuff for war, for the right, uh, right in the United States, et cetera, is here. People, and, it was really satisfying showing this other Bay Area that doesn't get talked about much and really trying to undermine the assumption that it's all peace and love and et cetera. It was really fun coming up with names for the maps, the right wing of the dove because, you know, we talk about hawks and doves, but if this place is a dove, it's got a right wing. And the wonderful artist, artist Sandow Burke um, did uh, an American eagle with a dove kind of half and half and actually a class, and there's a soldier in death with his reaper uh, there. And then this, uh, ep not epithet, this sort of motto from Horace, uh, nervi belli pecunia infinata, which means uh, infinite money is the sinew of war. And for the Bay Area, it's very much about, the, you know, about money, the, te the money and technology and research and weapons manufacture and petroleum and et cetera, and uh, this was also, this is a map that's a little harder to explain about downtown San Francisco. There's a cluster of historical forces, very few people know, around the center of the city, and uh, it was really satisfying to map them, these kind of dialogues about race and justice, et cetera, and some of them, there's a plaza called United Nations Plaza, which has a farmer's market twice a week, which is where the country comes, and which is like a miniature United Nations in a way. It's where the country comes to the city. It's in the food desert of the inner city, so it's a place where poor, poor people, many of them South Asian immigrants, can get really good, really cheap food. Uh, the farmers themselves are deeply multi-ethnic. There's a lot of Asian specialty produce and Latin American farmers as well there. But it, and literally the plaza has the text of the United Nations Charter, which was founded two blocks away, and the War Memorial and Opera House in 1945 written in it. So you have these layered over, but then you have histories, very complex histories about African Americans, Native Americans, Asian Americans, 
um, rights for gay and lesbian Americans, the murder of Harvey Milk and Mayor Moscone by the crazy supervisor, or you know, not that crazy justifies it, Dan White, and a lot of other kind of dialogues about meaning together. Just one of the things that exists in many places, but you have to really know a place intimately if it's not marked. And a lot of the most important histories, there's no plaque, there's no monuments, there's no statues, and so a map is a way to document that this, you know, these voices and, and different moments in time kind of layer over each other in a single place to create a kind of complex and meaningful. Uh, and your library director is referring to this one, which is a lot of people's favorite maps. It's called Monarchs and Queens, although not all the butterflies are monarchs and not all the gays and lesbians are queens by a long shot. But who could resist? I couldn't resist the title. The artist Mona Carone did the wonderful illustration uh, very brilliantly, where she managed to, with the diaphanous uh, garment of the Sister of Perpetual Indulgence waving her arms, um, to kind of, and the stream of butterflies, to kind of dominate the whole space without getting in the way of any of the information. It was a really brilliant kind of design solution to not just making an ornamental border or something in the corner, but to you know have this coexistence. And it's, every map I learned something and it changed my understanding of the city a little bit. One of the first things I did when I began the project is I took out just an ordinary street map of San Francisco. And I'm somebody who's supposed to know San Francisco really well. It's, it's been central to several of my books and uh, you know, I walk a lot. I wrote a book about walking that's partly in San Francisco, et cetera. When I took out the map, I realized I'd literally not been to about half of San Francisco. And um, I'm proud to say I've now been to about two fifths of San, three fifths of San Francisco. There's still a lot. Uh, and it's not a big city. It's seven miles by seven miles. But, you know, it's, in, it's not very big, but it is infinite. And uh, mapping the gay and lesbian uh, public spaces, a lot of which were bars, which were the safe spaces for queer people to meet and to be themselves in the dark, you know, in the dark ages before, uh, you know, Harvey Milk again, a lot of liberation happened. Um, was really interesting because we hear a lot of, like there's now a lot of gay bars for gay men. Um, what was really interesting is that in an area that's always thought about being about male beat poets, this area up on the upper left in North Beach actually had a huge number of lesbian and cross-dressing bars in the 20s through the 50s and very strong out in the open presence there. And this is another thing I like about maps is the exact specificity of information makes it hard to have generalized. Like people will, like I've, I've also done that with photography. I did a photographic project in Yosemite and people will often say in 1872 it was pristine and now it's developed. But when you go to the photographs, you're like, what exactly happened in each place? You can't generalize. You're like, well, this place is totally unrecognizable. This place hasn't changed a bit. This place actually had buildings that are no longer there and looks more pristine than it did in 1872. So you get really specific. So that every, there's a sort of cliche of North Beach and beatniks and poetry, except that, it, you know, and usually the beat poets you hear about are men, but there's all these fantastic lesbian bars in North Beach that you don't hear about at all. So, and then the butterflies have really specific locations. I picked, I think, 36 gay and lesbian public spaces and about the 36 species of butterflies we have in San Francisco. There's also, the pairings were really fun because they, for me, they were both about getting more bang for your buck that you get to map two things instead of one. But it's also about the coexistence that you can talk about, you know, you can talk about a city like this as a city of fountains, or you can talk about it as a city of railroads, or you can talk about it as a city of education, or a city of crime bosses of the gangster era, you know, that these things coexist. And sometimes to put two on the map is to kind of suggest a dialogue. And butter, the word mariposa, the Spanish word for butterfly is often a synonym for gay in a kind of fairy, limp wristed way in Spanish. So there's kind of a pun there. But I also like the sense for me of San Francisco as a refuge city. It has been since the gold rush, a place where people were a little safer in their eccentricities and anomalies than they were in other parts of the country. And San Francisco also has almost an island ecology. Some of these butterflies, like the Mission Blue, the Green Hair Streak, um, are extremely localized species. So for me, this was really a picture of San Francisco as a kind of refuge, a special environment in which things flourish, like the Sisters of Perpetual Indulgence, or the, blue, you know, the Mission Blue butterfly that might not flourish anywhere else.
So, and it's funny because it's, very, it's a very loving project, but it's not an uncritical project. You've seen right wing of the dove. This is another uh, map that's quite critical. And the artist, Sonny Taylor, uh, gave us a rift on the classical maps. You know, I think of 18th century maps having images that coexist with the cartography. You know, the, the wind, the puffs of wind in the corners of the map and the sea monsters. Sometimes strange figures striding across the newly explored continents. You know, newly explored for the cartographers' cultures and stuff. You know, and mermaids. And so this is a map about the food that nobody ever shuts up about in the Bay Area and the toxic waste we never talk about hardly at all, even though Silicon Valley with its 29 Superfund sites is the greatest concentration of Superfund sites in the country, even though the San Francisco Bay is paved with mercury from the gold rush, even though we have a huge number of uh, petroleum refineries that, uh, and Chevron here is the single biggest carbon emitter in the state of California. So Mutant Mermaids from Sunny Taylor and the other wonderful art that she did what was interesting, though, is like people in the barrier never shut up about food. It gets, and, but when you actually look at this as a food producing area, it gets really different. And you know, we weren't always such a fancy place. We're at the center of the great fruit and vegetable growing uh, zone of the United States. About 90% of all the produce in the country comes from California. A lot of it com came from the Bay Area before Silicon Valley was full of silicon, it was full of uh, stone fruit orchards, particularly uh, plums, prunes, and apricots, and cherries, and it was called the Valley of Heart's Delight. Um, but there's also a lot of quirky stuff. There's rice ceroni, there's hyper-local things like it's it's. Allegedly, the martini was invented in Martinez, California. And then you get, in, you get into odd, complicated relations. Um, this map actually still makes me kind of queasy. We created a shaded thing. The dark green is toxics, the light green is food, or the yellow, the yellow and green. And then we created, there's some things that are both. And uh, for example, we put so many tons of pesticides in Sonoma and Napa uh, vineyards that the wine production was both. And you get, we get a hell of a lot of wine out of this area but we put a hell of a lot of poison in. So I wanted people to kind of see those things together. And this is really a map about what ends up in your body that you might maybe sh don't think about and maybe should. But there's so many unknown histories of a place or not known well enough. One of the astonishing things about the Bay Area, it's African-American population increased tenfold during World War II. A huge number of people emigrated from the South, um, Texas and Oklahoma for the African-Americans for the good shipyard jobs and a chance to get away from Jim Crow, et cetera. And the shocking thing is that a huge number of those people are still where the shipyard jobs were, even though the shipyards mostly closed in 1946. They're in southeastern San Francisco in the Bayview, Hunters Point. They're in West Oakland and they're in Richmond. So another thing people don't know much about the Bay Area is that we were producing one warship a day for, a thousand, for the thousand days of World War II. We produced a thousand ships at the rate of a ship a day. We were hella productive. So, but this influx of African Americans came for the jobs. The jobs dried up, but all these other amazing things happened. Um, things that you have heard of, like the Pointer Sisters and Sylvester and Sly and the Family Stone, this huge, as well as uh, political things like the Black Panthers, a huge cultural flowering took place and is still taking place. I Probably nobody in this room knows that Tupac Shakur went to high school and lived in Marin City, which was one of the shipbuilding areas. It's still black, primarily black. It hasn't had a ship built since about 1946, as far as I know, although they did ship repair until recently. And he went to high school with all the rich kids in Mill Valley, or better or worse. At, um, and my friend Josh, and each map, almost every map was accompanied by an essay. My friend Joshua Jelly Shapiro, who's a music historian and geographer, did a lot of the research on the map with help from us and wrote a fantastic essay that was part of it. I wrote some of the essays myself. I commissioned some of them. And some of these allowed me to bring to fruition things that I've thought about for a long time, like the way there's a single street is like a, the way you take a core sample through soil a street can be like a core sample through a city. This street is Fillmore Street, named after the extremely um, little remembered and maybe not so great President Millard Fillmore. And um, I, I think, who I believe was a great compromiser. 
wasn't it? It was partly about Kansas territory and stuff, wasn't it? This is this is history before California's in the. Yeah, was the only president who was also a candidate of the Know Nothing Party? Yeah, which seems to have been born again. And he said, <laughs> uh, the Know Nothing Party was anti-Catholic, anti-immigrant, and anti-intellectual, and. Um, but um, so Fillmore Street begins with the landfill in the Marina District and runs th across Pacific Heights, which is where people like Diane Feinstein and Nancy Pelosi and the Gettys, the super rich people live. And then it, and then it heads right down into an African American neighborhood, which is where you see all the black name tags. That was an incredibly culturally rich area, another outpouring of the golden era that came after the shipyards. And it was a great area for jazz, blues, um, R&B, and other music. And it was destroyed by urban renewal, um, which was nicknamed in San Francisco, as in so many cities, Negro removal. Is, you know, they had a, and they tore down those beautiful Victorian houses that cost $2 million a piece were what they were tearing down. They called them blighted, which was a code word for black people live here. It's one of, the, one of the stories that's true of a lot of American cities that doesn't really get told enough. We put uh, elevated highways through West Oakland, through uh, the black neighborhood in San Francisco, through the Bronx, um, they, they, you know, through uh, the Black Bottom in Detroit, through so many parts of, you know, there's this weird destruction of the old cities in the 1950s and 60s with these kind of high modernist fantasies of control and suburbanized that destroyed uh, a lot of stuff, including what was called the Harlem of the West because it was so culturally rich here. And I actually, those the places where they claim they're going to build more sanitary housing sat vacant for 30 years. I saw them break ground in the 1980s to build some pretty crappy high-rise condos. So, but then you go on to other histories and other things that the neighborhood was, that it was uh, Jewish immigrants. It was also, the reason that it was a neighborhood that was available for um, African Americans to move in is because uh, Japanese Americans, um, another kind of brutal relocation, had been shipped off during World War II to concentration camps in the eastern Sierra, the desert, uh, and other places around the country. Um, which was also kind of a land grab whereby billions of dollars of real estate were taken from people who owned it legitimately and seized by opportunists. Occasionally, I actually am friends with a lot of Japanese Americans whose families went through that. There were cases in which friends of the non-Japanese non American friends became caretakers and gave them their property back, but there were a lot more opportunists. So uh, very thrifty, hardworking people were um, wiped out and had to start over again after World War II. And that neighborhood has a few Japanese things, but was never the same again. So this is a wonderful map that Ellison Pebworth, who also did the cover image and the, tit the beautiful title page did, called Phantom Coast. And it shows the 19th century uh, coast from the native people through the Spanish and the gold rush up to the early 20th century. And like the coast itself disappeared because it was all marshy and complex and it was landfilled. It sticks out a hell of a lot further than it did then. And she painted in a kind of 18th century mapping style these wonderful little icons of different things, whales, cowboys, uh, gold miners, weeping native people in their reed boats, what Mission Bay, which has been filled in it was a rail yard for the Southern Pacific in the early 20th century. It's now a um, biotech uh, University of California, San Francisco research campus. Um, was at, and it's one of the jokes for this atlas was, did you know there used to be fishermen at Fisherman's Wharf? Did you know that Mission Bay used to be a bay? But when the native people first saw the Spaniard ships, um, they fell to weeping in their reed boats. And so the Spanish name was the Bay of, Re of Weepers. And so she has the weepers Again, I'm sorry that this stuff isn't easier to see, but um, so, you know, and it was really about also trying to, thinking of a city and as many individuals, but also many different populations. And um, this is a map of the old industrial city, and it came partly out of a comment from a friend of mine, Paul Yamazaki, who's a bookseller at City Lights Books. Um, who said to me that the bar, the, the, we still have about two dozen, maybe less than that now, about 
20 bars that open at 6 a.m. And that's a relic of when people worked the graveyard shift and the factories, the food, there were food factories that ran around the clock. There were um, ships being unloaded around the clock. There were sailors coming into port and things. So th the 6 a.m. bars were one of the relics of that. And we wanted to mark that. Mark that. So we did that map. And, um, and another map of different communities. One of the things that had most struck me about the infinite city of the coexistence of really different populations is we say Latino as though that's a coherent identity. But the world I live in, you have these inner city kids. And every city has them. I'm sure Kansas City does. These kids who've barely left their neighborhoods. And we have kids who've never been to the beach who live you know, on the tip of a peninsula surrounded by Pacific waters. We have uh, and things like that. You know, they get so localized in their neighborhoods. Their parents work two jobs. They live in this very rich, dense, dangerous, territorialized space where like this is our territory, this is the rival gang's territory. It's dangerous to cross 18th Street, but we completely hold this this area, etc. So they coexist with day laborers who are undocumented immigrants who've traveled the way Odysseus traveled across uh, the GNC with this incredible kind of adventure. And some of them and some of them tell these incredible stories about walking across the desert, about being smuggled and sent back, about being picked up by La Migra and so, so you have like the greatest travelers of San Francisco and the kids who haven't left the neighborhood. They both speak Spanish, they live in the same neighborhood, they have everything and nothing in common. And we failed in some ways on this map, partly because we let Shiz get carried away with putting too much information in. But one of the things that's really interesting, you can see the blue area and the kind of rust colored area. The names Sereños or Southerners and Norteños come from the gangs of Los Angeles. And these gangs are statewide and more than statewide and have strong presences in the prison system. So a lot of what's important for this map is what's off the map, which is the prisons that you know, a lot of these gang kids go to, join prison gangs, come back, bring a lot of that with them. So we're able to put part of what's not on the map here. This is the boulevard lined with little figures where the day laborers line up to pick up work every morning. And it's also kind of where the mission stops being the mission. Car making maps is incredibly powerful. I dropped this, the Mexican border in there and the southern end of the neighborhood. And it was so fun and exciting to be able to mash up those two scales. But the funny thing about the Sereños and the Norteños is the southerners are north of the northerners because the names don't describe the territory they hold in San Francisco. The name describes um, what their affiliation with gangs in other places are. There's always something off the map that comes from elsewhere that uh, carries you someplace else. I define a place sometimes as a point of intersection of many um, uh, many f forces, I and mean, we talk about we talk about place all the time as though we need know what it means. But I'm not sure that places exist in that something always comes from elsewhere. Something is always going elsewhere. There's, you know, there's a certain kind of instability there, and there's always uh, things are always moving around. So to me, a place is kind of a collision, a cross pollination, a, a meeting point, and that inspired this map, which is called Who Am I Where? Quién Soy Donde? I did it with my friend Guillermo Gomez Pena. And it's also about the idea that even on a very local scale, um, space changes very dramatically. And the Norteño and Sereno kids in this one neighborhood have marked up the neighborhood in these very intense ways. But I also feel as I go around a very multi ethnic city and a city full of very rich and very poor people, who I am changes. And in the Marina District, which is one of our swanky districts, I'm just a lady with a bad handbag. Whereas, you know, in Hunter's Point, I joke that I'm white, white at 100 yards and stuff, that your identity is constantly shifting as you move around. If you're in a place where everybody's like you, if you're in a place where everybody's different than you, the cliches and expectations and criteria by which people inspect you, the way that you interact constantly shifts. So even, even within a city, it shifts. And I always say to be Chinese, we often talk as though, you know, like, oh, your identity is Chinese. But to be Chinese in China is very different than to be Chinese in San Francisco, which is probably really different than to be, well, we know it's really different than to be Chinese in, say, rural Kansas. Your identity is um, constantly shifting as you move around. And so this map is really a dialogue with my friend, the performance artist Guillermo Gomez Pena, who's from Mexico, it was perfect for, for it, both because his work is about this and because he's been a passionate San Franciscan for 20-something years. 
and because he's a non-white immigrant man, uh, so he was a good foil for me. And so we wrote about, in this dialogue we sometimes perform out loud about who we are in different places, not with a sense that who Guillermo and Rebecca are is terribly important, but that anybody anywhere could ask themselves, like, where does my identity change? Where does it shift from where I'm like everybody to where, I'm, where I don't fit in, to where I feel safe, to where I feel imperiled, to where I know my way around to terra incognita? So, and because cities are the world in miniature, one of the maps I didn't do, I thought of mapping the whole world because we have Russian food and Russian immigrants and we have you know, Samoan food and Samoan immigrants and everything in between in the Bay and in, in San Francisco. My wonderful friend Jaime Cortez did this map, um, which your library chief was quoting, uh, which is about the tribes of San Francisco past and present. And he has a lot of really delightful figures, a 19th century Chinese uh, man and a gold miner. And he purposely made the gold miner with his uh, bed roll and shovel look a lot like the homeless person um, over here and um, a dot-com era uh, hipster on his scooter, 19th century Irish woman in a neighborhood that's still Irish, and Rosie the Riveter, uh, tribal elder, and these very poignant children because San Francisco is only 13% children, which is about half what a normal city is because so many it, real estate is so expensive, so many people are childless um, or leave when they have kids, et cetera. And, uh, so, you know, and there's so many ways uh, to describe a place. And um, this one came out of a map that the newspaper does every year of all the murders committed in the city. All the, each, every red dot is a murder. And this, again, is how I think maps are so powerful. If I said to you there were 99 murders in San Francisco in 2008, you'd, that would, you'd say, oh, that's very sad. But if you look at this map, you're like, oh, my God, somebody died here. And wow, there's a cluster here, and this place, nobody seems to murder anybody at all. And why did that one person get murdered over here? You know, it really, the specificity of information gives you a very different feel for what that means. And I decided, because I was doing the double mapping, uh, death and beauty, um, monarchs and queens, um, poison, uh, poison and food, that I, would do, that I would do this as death and beauty. And I went through a big internal struggle about what beauty was going to be and realized eventually that um, a lot of the conventional notions of beauty were pretty annoying. And I didn't want it to look like, oh, the rich people and the middle class people on the west side of town have beauty and the poor people have death. Um, what seemed, and so I, I focused on Monterey cypress trees, which are a hyper local kind of tree now planted all over the world, but they used to only grow on the Monterey coast. And they're planted all over San Francisco. They're kind of our epic tree. You can see their silhouette, silhouette and shadow on the map here. And cypress trees were traditionally associated with death and graveyards. And, um, you know, and they're these kind of big masculine trees. Most of the dead are, most of the murder victims are men murdered by other young men. And it felt right somehow. And also the kind of stability and calmness and memorial function trees sometimes serve. So and then we had to run around like crazy and try and map as many Monterey cypresses as we could. And it's not exactly accurate because trees are too small and there's too many of them to put dots on a map at this scale, which is another thing that you learn about with mapping is that there's lots of things where you can't be comprehensive, or the detail is too much, et cetera. And so you're always selecting. And here I selected something that like the inner city kids and the day laborers was really exciting to me, but I think this map succeeded better. And, you know, you often see a route, you know, people will draw like the route they took on their vacation, the route they walked in a single day or something like that. But when you spend your whole life in one place, you can imagine your whole life is kind of like a path around the city. And I've been fascinated by these centenarians who'd spent their whole life in San Francisco. What does it mean to spend 100 years in one small place? This would be a great Kansas City map too. I bet there's some major centenarian. Uh, action and memory here. So we found four centenarians. We, we cut Elaine Jang some slack. I think she was in her early 90s. And, um, but she was great because she was Chinese American and had different, a different kind of story than the two Italian and one German American we found. San Francisco was really pretty white 100 years ago. And my wonderful former student, uh, great writer Heather Smith, interviewed them, got the specific data, 
Shiz put them on a map and connected the dots so that each of their lives became kind of like these, um, these routes you could follow. We found one place they all went, which was the Sutro Baths, these, this great, these great public baths or semi-public baths. They were privately owned, but they were sort of built for the public out at the western end of the city right here. Except that Elaine Zhang never went in the baths because they didn't let Asian people in. And uh, another one of the women had her handbag stolen there. But, um, but they told us wonderful stories. And then the map seemed a little bit sweet to me. And so I asked, uh, um, so I found a map of evictions because we're a gentrifying city, real estate is at a premium, the, te the tech uh, industry produces tons of new jobs, tons of new people with money, and they come in and um, shop like crazy for property, and they've created an incentive for landlords to evict tenants. And so there's these dots are five, so that I call the map 400 years, which was kind of ironic because San Francisco is only about 160 years old. But if each life lived in San Francisco, you know, it's thought of consecutively rather than, um, you know, all at once, then the city's really millions of years old. But, um, you know, and this was 400 years of those millions of years of human life that have been lived in the city. But then, you know, the evictions were about not everybody gets to spend 100 years or a lifetime here. A lot of people have been unceremoniously forced out. And the evictions felt like balance. And Heather pointed out that these people owned their own homes, and that's part of why they got to spend their century here. At um, This was one of the maps. I, I came up with ideas for a lot of the maps. I didn't come up with all of them. Jaime Cortez, for example, came up with the tribes of San Francisco. This was proposed by my friend Paul Lafarge, a wonderful novelist who lived in San Francisco for many years but now lives in New York, which was to take, San Francisco looks a little like a head in profile. It looks a lot more like one when my friend uh, Paz de la Calzada drew her trademark flowing locks on it. And it was really funny. We were kind of uh, talking about what gender is San Francisco. And I decided that San Francisco had gender lots of it, but not differentiated. So it has a goatee and beautiful flowing hair. <laughs> and uh, the goatee kind of fits with the jutting chin of um, Hunter's Point, one of the shipyards. And Paul did a wonderful job of putting the old phrenological categories. You know, phrenology was that junk that, that faux science of reading people's personality through their head bumps. And, um, you know, so, um, so he put these categories that are extremely funny, but actually tell you a lot about the areas in funny ways, and wrote a wonderful essay using phrenology to interpret the city. At, um, so and this was another map that was really fun. I felt like we were making so many maps about land, we needed to make maps about water. The whole Pacific coast has a, um, from south of San Francisco to northern Alaska has salmon migration. Salmon hatch in fresh water, often in quite small streams, way upstream, often hundreds of miles inland in the Pacific Northwest in particular, up the Columbia River, the Snake River, et cetera. And then as they mature, they swim downstream. And they go out to sea as, uh, as you know, they hatch as these tiny fingerlings. They go out to sea as pretty big fish. They spend a few years in um, eating the abundance of the sea, and then they swim upstream. Almost all of the nutrients flow downstream in nature, so that the upstream is always giving things to downstream. Salmon are how some of that comes back in abundance. And salmon come back some places in such density that they, they, feed, they don't just feed the bears and eagles that you see in like Alaska films preying on them. They feed the people, they f and actually they feed uh, lots of things in the water. They actually help feed the trees and the soil and the landscape around them. And uh, so it's this huge nutrient flow upstream. And, this, you know, and it's very present. There's two kinds of salmon, Chinook and Coho, swimming, swimming up the streams of, uh, of the Bay Area, greatly reduced but still present. And I paired that with not just with Buddhism in, Sar in the B San Francisco Bay Area, which would be way too much to map, not just with Zen Buddhism in the San Francisco Bay Area, which would still be too much to map, but with Soto Zen Buddhism, which is a specific school. Some of you might have heard of uh, Shunryu Suzuki Roshi, who wrote Zen Mind, Beginner's Mind. He came to minister to the Japanese American community as a Buddhist priest in 1959 found that the Japanese Americans really just wanted him to officiate over ceremonies like funerals and things and that it wasn't very interesting. 
But all these young Americans wanted to learn how to meditate. They really wanted to get to the heart of what is Buddhism, what is Zen. And at one point, the Jap and there were more and more kind of sh uh, shaggy, eccentric Americans showing up in this Japanese temple. And, at one, and so the Japanese community said, it's us or them. So I went off with the young kids and was really what brought Zen Buddhism to America. He was this funny, short guy who didn't speak English very well. And from him came the powerhouse of the San Francisco Zen Center, which has trained um, hundreds of priests who've gone on to other places all over the world and sister temples all over the world where you know, the tradition is, uh, is being perpetuated and Buddhist communities exist. And it felt also like this guy kind of swimming upstream, coming out of the Pacific from Japan to us was part of it. So we mapped those two things, but also the pairings had different kinds of meanings and agendas for it, but it also felt like there was the salmon, you know, and the, you know, they spawn and die at the same time. So they're dying as they're giving birth and impregnating. And so that the sort of the circle of life and death is extraordinarily intense and, and extraordinarily clear cut. And Zen is in some sense about escaping the wheel of, uh, reincarnation and uh, that kind of transcendence and about other kinds of wheels. So it felt like a good pairing. And then um, there were a few other things uh, that I, f I wanted to have one map that wasn't disturbing and weird and complicated and sophisticated. <laughs> and um, so I want, cause it's a, it's a, I think it's a beautiful book. I want it to be uh, kind of kid friendly. So I did a treasure map. These are things that people can actually yeah. visit all over the city. I picked 49 since we're, both seven miles by seven miles and associated with the 49ers, which was a bunch of crazy guys with pickaxes and gold pants before as a football team. And, um, and it was really fun. Maps are so subjective. And I showed you the three different versions of red and blue on the national map. And we often, we often believe maps are uh, objective, but now that you've been exposed to me, you'll know how manipulative and subjective and idiosyncratic they are. And you'll look at them and say, why the hell do they decide to show us nothing but freeways and, and highways when they could be showing us all these, you know, all these cultural things, all these other things? So it was really fun making the extremely subjective choice of what the 49 treasures were going to be. And you can see wonderful things like downtown San Francisco. They picked that for downtown during the gold rush because it was a great natural cove. And then the real estate was so valuable, they filled it in and it stopped being a cove at all. Uh, unless they build flood walls, um, and climate change will, uh, and rising waters will take it back, and a lot of the other landfill areas, although we're a steep enough area that we won't have the dramatic transformation that like most of Florida and Bangladesh and a lot of more low-lying cities will. So, and um, I could go, I've gone on for a long time, so I think I'll stop. I, I did take a version of this to Laramie, which was really fun. Uh, I was an artist in residence in Laramie, Wyoming. And I felt like to make, it was pretty easy to make the case that San Francisco's rich and complicated and uh, multifaceted and like, so what, everybody knows that. But to do it in Laramie, Wyoming with students kind of proved the point that every place has rich and surprising and unexpected ways that its history can be told. And my students came up with the greatest maps. My student Jacqueline Pham did a map called Saloons and Salons. Laramie thinks it's this, this manly old west town. That's all the iconography you see. It's all these swaggering cowboys and frontiersmen and stuff. But it, she proved through mapping that it has more salons, beauty salons, than it has saloons. <laughs> Although she pointed out that some people may be going to the salons as preparatory to going to the saloons. <laughs> and just the students did really wonderful mapping. One, map, one of them mapped a kind of hot and cold map of the Cold War with the missile silos that are across the Great Plains, including Wyoming, the nuclear missile silos for the, the Cold Wars that never happened, and the hot war of climate change that's creating uh, pine bark beetle in infestations on an unprecedented scale, and therefore huge amounts of pine die off. So you have these kind of hot and cold things happening together on the map. And uh, my student, Lou Ling Osofsky, came to me and said, you know, I came to Laramie to not think about place. And I'm kind of homesick for uh, San Francisco and Asia, where I spent four years before I came here. So I was like, well, why don't you map the wild, wild east? And so she also proved, well, she mapped all, the, all things Asian in this town that thinks of itself as the uttermost west, including, you know, the 70% of stuff at Walmart made in China. But, you know, every city is like that now. I'm sure Kansas City is, you've got sushi and you've got Thai food. 
and you've got Taekwondo and you've got yoga and you've got Zen and you've got, you know, that the whole United States has become deeply Asian, but in so many different incremental ways that you don't really realize it until you look at a map. This is a lot of why maps are so exciting to me is they make things apparent and urgent and visceral and interesting in a way nothing else can. And I'm incredibly excited that there's apparently going to be a Kansas City atlas. And we're working, I'm working with my wonderful collaborator, Rebecca Snedeker, who's a native New Orleanian on a New Orleans atlas. I plan on continuing doing atlases, but I'm really excited that there's going to be atlases I don't have to do major work on. Because I want there to be, I want every city to have a map, an atlas like Infinite City, and I don't want to do it all myself. So thank you, thank you so much, and I'd be delighted to take questions.